Okay, so we're now recording. And over to Alice Amanda. Right. Um, good evening, everyone. And a special welcome this evening to Professor Alan Harris, recently retired NeoShield lead project scientist, Richard Miles, minor planet director of the BAA section, and of course, our speaker, Duncan Linnet. The next webinar is on the 14th of December when we have Dr. Luke Daly, whose presentation is entitled, Where Do Meteorites Come From? I will email the link tomorrow for that one, along with a link for a Zoom meeting okay. hosted by Tweetdale Astronomical Society on the 17th. They've got Dave Eagle, and it's a different um, talk to the one that he gave us. Uh, I have spoken today to Katrina Turner, uh, the bank call um, manager, uh, and who said there is no sign of the bank hall opening anytime soon. There has been renovation plans, um, a thing we, but they, they don't know when the renovations are taking place. So she says that they've been drawn up, but they've not been passed or anything so far. But she will let us know when the bank call is going to open, but she says it'll be many months before that happens. Because they're, they're going to they probably do the renovations first because nothing's been done to the bank hall for since it was built, really. So they're going to do that presumably before. But knowing the council, they could change their mind. They could open the hall and then shut it again for the renovation. So we just have to wait and see. Right, tonight we have Roy Bryce with the Space News. Then our main speaker for this evening, Duncan Lunin, whose presentation is entitled Incoming Asteroid, part two. So I'll hand over to Roy for the Space News. Okay, thank you. Hey, if folk aren't already muted, if you could mute it, it would be helpful. Uh, sorry, Richard, you're not muted. If you mute that screen, please. Richard Miles. Sorry. Hold on, say again. Could you mute, please? You're the only one that's not muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. And my mute it's no muting. <laughs> right, well, just keep quiet then. <laughs> hey. I think we've got the video as well. <laughs> so, a uh, slightly different format this time round. What I'm going to be doing is uh, showing one or two videos because we did a wee test last week. The videos work quite well. And also normally when I do this, I try only to you know, choose stuff that I think people haven't heard of. But okay. uh, on this occasion, because there's been so much of notes been going on last week i'm actually going to run a couple of videos for things that you may well have seen if you have i apologize but anyway what is the video Dennis, you're, because you've got both machines in the same room it's feeding back yeah but no it's starting the video or all that if you turn off dave's or one of them okay how do i get them how did I get it to stop the video? I'm just wait for me and Janice to sort themselves out. Uh. Just give me a sec, Janice. Okay, that's better, thank you. Right, so if you were on the call last week, you'll have noted they were saying Arecibo. They decided that it was to, they had to decommission the telescope as it was too dangerous to try and repair it. But as you're probably aware, it's more difficult to repair it now. Yeah. 
Liz, whoever Liz is, you haven't muted yourself and we can hear you. dramatic. When I started doing the space news, that was not in general release, but I think most people might have seen that. You might have seen this one. So, so somebody said you know, it's a tragic to lose the telescope, but the reason it got decommissioned was because engineers had decided it was too dangerous to attempt to repair it. So now that the cables have snapped and the heavy weight in the centre has fallen, at least when they do go in to do the, uh, well, the engineering work, they've actually got to return the site to as it was before there was any building there. So now at least that can be done in safety. Roy, could you speak up a little bit? Please? All right, okay, will do. So another thing that happened recently is the Gaia third data release. The motion of stars in the outskirts of our galaxy hints at significant changes in the history of the Milky Way. This and other equally fascinating results come from a set of papers that demonstrate the quality of ESA's Gaia early third data release, which was made public a couple of days ago. Astronomers from the Gaia Data Processing and Analysis Consortium saw the evidence of the Milky Way's past by looking at stars in the direction of the galaxy's anti-center. This is the exact opposite direction on the sky from the center of the galaxy. The results on the anti-center come from one of the four demonstration papers released alongside the Gaia data. The others use Gaia data to provide a huge extension to the census of nearby stars, and that derives the shape of the solar system's orbit around the center of the galaxy. And it probes structures in two nearby galaxies, the Milky Way. The papers are designed to highlight the improvements in quality of the newly published data. Here's a short video giving a taste of what's been discovered so far in this early release. Here's something else I heard, which absolutely amazed me. The Kepler mission was designed to seek out exoplanets. And over the last 11 years, it's provided data on over 4,000 exoplanets. 
Gaia, which we've just been looking at, wasn't designed to look for exoplanets, but a quick scan through the latest data release has thrown up another 5,000 candidates. In other words, on the fly, Gaia has done more than Kepler did in its planned mission. I know you've probably all been following the amazing Changi 5 mission over the last few days, but I thought you still might like to see a couple of videos that explain the mission in clear detail. Firstly, there's an animation of the whole mission plan, and then another one using the actual footage from the moon. It's not all in Chinese, don't worry. sort of gets me about that nowadays it's you know it's as if it was just a quick jump up to the moon again it shows you the astonishing complexity of the mission and yet just popped up there grab some samples and then pop back again it's truly amazing here's the actual photos Thank you. 
Well done them. So again, I'm not sure if you might have heard of this one, but hopefully you haven't because it's quite interesting. Astronomers in Australia have just mapped 83% of the observable universe in just 300 hours. The New Sky Survey, which Australia's National Science Agency described in a statement as a Google map of the universe, marks the completion of a big test for the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder radio telescope, a network of 36 antennas rooted in the remote Western Australian outback. While astronomers have been using ASCAP to scour the sky for radio signatures since 2012, the telescope's full array of antennas has never been used in a single sky survey until now. By harnessing the telescope's full potential, researchers mapped roughly 3 million galaxies in the southern sky. As many as one million of these distant galaxies may be previously unknown to astronomy, the researchers wrote, and that's likely just the beginning. With the success of this first survey, the team are already planning even more in-depth observations in the coming years. While each of the telescope's 36 receivers took vast panoramic pictures of the sky, a dedicated network of supercomputers worked double time to combine them. The resulting map, which covers 83% of the sky, is a combination of 903 individual images, each containing 70 billion pixels. For comparison, the highest definition cameras for sale snap a few hundred million pixels per image. And here's another interesting story from Australia's ASCAP telescope. In September 2019, Anna Kapinska of ASCAP team gave a presentation showing interesting objects she's found while browsing new radio astronomical data. She'd started noticing very weird shapes that she couldn't fit easily into any known type of object. Among them was a picture of a ghostly circle of radio emission hanging out in space like a cosmic smoke ring. No one had ever seen anything like it before and they had no idea what it was. A few days later, another team member, Amy Lenk, and the second one, even more spooky than Anna's. The evolutionary map of the universe project plans to boldly probe parts of the universe where no telescope has gone before. It can do so because ASCAP can survey large swathes of the sky very quickly, probing to a depth previously only reached in tiny areas of sky and being especially sensitive to faint diffuse objects like these. The team searched the rest of the data by eye and found a few more of these mysterious round blobs. They dubbed them ORCs, which stands for Odd Radio Circles. But the big question is, of course, what are they? At first, they suspected an imaging artifact, perhaps generated by a software glitch. But they soon confirmed that they are real using other radio telescopes. They have no idea how big or far away they are 
They could be objects in our galaxy, perhaps a few light years across, or they could be far away in the universe, maybe millions of light years across. When they look at images taken with optical telescopes in the position of the ORCs, they see nothing. The rings of radio emission are probably caused by clouds of electrons, but why don't we see anything in the visible wavelengths of light? We don't know. But finding a puzzle like this, of course, is the dream of every astronomer. And that's the space news to, for tonight. So back to Alice Amanda. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, oh, I've lost. I've lost the main screen. Yeah. That's because good. I had to answer Alan Henderson or to send him the link. Right. And now I've lost, I've lost everything. If you just click back on it, because when I'm changing off to sharing screen, sometimes the, the computer gets confused. So if you just click on the main screen with your mouse, it might sort it. Um, oh, there we go. Right. That's it. Okay. All right. I just lost it. Uh, right. Thanks very much, Roy. That well, I mean, I couldn't see anything, but it's no, very interesting <laughs> listening to it. They were nice videos. <laughs> I'll watch it on the recording. Um, but it was just, I was getting confused. As you know, I'm not very technical, Anton, and I was getting confused. But is there any questions for Roy? Please, no. I don't know any answers. Bob, you're still... No? Okay. All right. Right, thanks very much for that. Um, right, Duncan has been an author, researcher, broadcaster, editor, critic, and tutor since 1970. And this talk tonight, and the one we had previously from Duncan, are based on his latest book. So let's give Duncan our usual warm cars welcome. Okay, so are we just going straight into the recording then? Duncan, do you like to say anything or should we just go straight into it? What do you want to do? I'm fine, just uh, go ahead when you're ready. Straight in. Okay, uh, I haven't done it this way before. It might take me a second or two just to get this running. Hmm. And as I say, this might take me a second. I'm not seeing my front screen, so hold on a sec. Uh, it's telling me I've got to stop the recording. I'm going to have to stop the recording. It's not letting me do it. And then I'll switch it back on again in a second. 